The celestial voice that you've just heard is that of Frederica von Stade in this new recording of the aria K. Faro from the opera Orpheus by Gluck. Welcome to the evening concert. This is Terry Hawkins with another edition of Vocalese. Joining me this evening is Marilyn Hagberg of the Drama and Literature Department, and it is our distinct pleasure to welcome back to the program that wonderful voice that you heard just a moment ago, one of the great singers of our era, Frederica von Stade, who joins us after just having sung last night a stunning recital at the San Francisco Opera House. And it's very gracious of you to come and talk with us so soon after the recital. Thank you. Thanks for having me. The first program that we did back in the spring received so many phone calls from listeners saying how much they enjoyed not only your singing, but also your comments about the music as oh, well. Oh, great. Good. And at, at one point, Delighted I think we to had hear it. the entire station crew all crowded <laughs> around the broadcast booth <laughs> listening to the music. So you're oh, sort of great. by popular demand. Oh, <laughs> thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. I'd like to talk a little bit about the recital that you sang last night. You chose a lovely program of music f that, for the most part, is not that well known. How do you go about selecting works for a recital such as that? Um, you think a little, you have a lot of considerations. You know, I have to think of a little bit what's been on around within the season, and you give one eye to that. Um, what I pick more and more music that I just adore. You know, I find that's the the most fun to do. I was very aware that you know the opera house is is not the the total ideal for a concert hall because it's so big and and it was I did feel that that separation of, of being across the orchestra pit from the public that I'm not used to in most recitals. But so that I geared it a little bit with that in mind, mm -hmm. thinking of what might not be specifically operatic because they, ha you know, there's opera all year long. So I think as much as anything, I pick concerts from what I love, you know. And it, recently I've been loving more and more singing in English. You know, having spent most of my career singing in foreign tongues, foreign to me. It's a great joy to to sing in English and there are these one there's so many great composers now, William Bolcom and Conrad Souza and Dominic Argento and they're writing wonderful songs with wonderful poems for the voice. And so it's a it's a kind of a special joy. That was a very nice selection of uh, American songs that you sang, <coughs> uh, songs in, in English by uh, Virgil Thompson, Charles Ives, Aaron Copeland, and um, Volcom. And they were really delightful songs, but um, you, we talked about this last time, too, during our spring conversation, that English is not the easiest language to sing. It, it's uh, a little harder to get around some of the consonants and vowels than, say, Italian or even the French, and yet you do it very well. Well, it's um, English, but we ha I mean, the, the killer of the voice of of the the sung note in English is the diphthong, and that's something that really doesn't exist in Italian. That's mm -hmm. why it's quite hard for Americans or English speaking people to make the totally, you know, faultless transition into a Romance language. They, it just doesn't exist. The 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 Italian is. It's the language of song because all the vowels are open and totally pure. And we have so many I either, and mm -hmm. we, we go through uh, Y all the time, and that stops the voice. And it's no fun, frankly, for a public, especially an English-speaking public, to hear songs and not be able to understand them. So you have to overemphasize it, and sometimes it can sound quite harsh. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a little bit the challenge of it. There was a marvelous woman called M Madeline Marshall who used to teach it at uh, Juilliard who just wrote the Bible on singing in English and it's all principles of, of Italian song, mm -hmm. you know, that she kind of put into a package and it's it's very successful, you know, and it's, when you when you study it, it's quite funny. It's, you know, so mother, and it sounds <laughs> terribly arch, but when you actually sing it in the context of an American accent, which is my accent, it works. 
you know, but was if you go mother, it, it, but it, it's it's quite comical when you're studying it. You gave us quite a range of language in your recital, in fact. Not only the American songs, but also you sang in Italian, French, and German, and Argentinian. The yeah. final group were Argentinian songs. So uh, did this take a lot of gear shifting in one evening? It seems to be a, lo a lot of languages you had to keep in mind. Well, sp the Spanish is new to me, and I'm going around in my car with those Berlitz language tapes going, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Puedo hablar and all day, uh, but the lucky thing is, of I had the the wonderful support of the my new community in studying a little bit of the Argentinian because Argentine the, is a slightly different Spanish, and there's a great lady who's a friend who's from the Argentine, a v marvelously interesting woman, and so I cornered her one day and she helped me, and then there's a marvelous man who. His name is Tony Seelenbacher, and he has a beautiful jewelry shop in Alameda, and he's from Austria. So I kept cornering him. I've been cornering him for Rosenkavalier and going into the shop and saying, Tony, have you got 10 minutes? You see, there's just, you know, we always, Americans always sound American in German, and he's been just <laughs> terrific. So I've, I've, uh, tapped the talents of Alameda. Oh, you have an unofficial coach? There. An unofficial <laughs> coach, and he's just terrific. He's marvelous, you know. The Hinastera songs that you sang at the end of the program, those are beautiful songs. Aren't they songs. pretty? Yes, they are. And do I you have any plans of recording those? Um, Marty and I have been asked to do a couple of things, and I, you know, nothing. We're doing a French record coming up, but I think we will, and I had the nicest telephone call from his widow, she, she's a wonderful pianist and lives in... And I've met Hinaster. I met him in, in Switzerland years ago. And, and she, she said she'd send some of the songs that he had made different notations. They're impossible to play. Oh. Uh, Martin Katz is the genius of the, the accompanying world. He really is the total magic man. And I'm so lucky because he is about one of the most respectful musicians of how things are written and trying to excavate a little bit to find out what's behind them and what is what do you really mean of a, of a certain rhythm. Bolcom, for example, I'm working on some songs by Bolcom called the Cabaret Songs, and he writes a pachanga <laughs> for a tempo. Now, do you know what a pachanga is? Not it's a, hand, no. it's, a, it's a kind of a, you know, a dance step. It's a... You know, but it's such a great description, and Marty is the only man I know who'll go and find out what a pachanga sounds like. <laughs> well, the Hina Stare songs are a wonderful combination of a very beautiful lyrical uh, vocal line with these very striking rhythms, rhythms and harmonies yeah, in, yeah. in the He's piano, a, but they work together so, yeah, so wonderfully yeah. well. I really hope you, you do Thank re record you. Thanks. those. Thank you. I've fallen in love with the songs, I'd, and they're quite famous, you know, Folk songs, really. They're kind of everybody knows, especially the Aroro, the, the, the little lullaby. Let's we, turn now to something that you have recorded, and that is one of the folk song settings by Cantaloupe. You did several of them last night that I don't think you have recorded, the ones that you sang. No, last those night. are, um, I'm not sure the ones I did last night have been orchestrated. They're actually called the Chant de France, and they're based on French folk songs. And I'm not sure. I don't think they've been orchestrated, though I'm not sure. We're going to listen now to an excerpt from the Songs of the Auvergne, probably the most well-known of the set, the Bailero. Alias the Shepherd Song, isn't that? The, isn't yeah, it, it is. It's two shepherds song. singing to each other across a large gorge. <laughs> You've just heard the Bailero from the Cantaloupe Songs of the Auvergne, performed by Frederica von Stade. I want to go to something you were talking about, your accompanist. This is a very important aspect in a recital. It's, it's really a collaboration, and a uh, question I have is how often and how closely do you work with your accompanist? Um, well, we've done so much. I've worked with Marty 20 years, but if we're doing anything new, we usually get together for a, a weekend and go through the songs over and over again. I come to him with everything learned. Marty just will go through them. But he, that's what his, his job is now. He is the head of the music department in, in accompanying at University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. And 
it's been wonderful for him because he was on the road most of the time with his divas. Um, and now he says it's, you know, he has his children, he has his students who he loves. And one of the things that I have treasured of my, coll of my collaboration with Morty is his ability to teach and to open up, you know, he's, he's quite demanding. I mean, he says, you know, Flicka, you, what is your point of view about this? What is being said here? Is it this? And that changes all the time, but he makes you specific and you take a breath for a reason or you don't take a breath for a reason. And you, in this particular world of song, which has changed because we've been pushing them into bigger and bigger halls where there are less communicative abilities because mm -hmm. you're so far away yeah. and you're in such a, mm -hmm. a monster of a, of a, of a setting, you need more and more to be clear. You know, some, you know, it, it becomes, you become more demonstrative. The, the kind of the, the, the face sometimes isn't enough. Um, and Morty has a fantastic sense of humor as well. But underlying it all, in the 25 years I've worked with him, he is no less really passionate about music today than he was. If, if anything, he's more so. Mm -hmm. And he is like playing tennis with a very good tennis player. You play better. You, and t to sing with him, I mean, he knows everything. He, um, he's right there if you're in trouble or you're, you can tell if you feel like stretching a phrase, he's right there. And he, he has this great underlying sense of rhythm in his playing and everything he does that just makes it terrific. And he's, he practices nonstop. He's very, do he's about the most professional musician I know. He is an outstanding accompanist. I'm always delighted when I attend a recital and find that he is a company yeah. singer. So it's a real collaboration. It is. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, um, you know, there's nothing any less spectacular about playing an accompaniment than there is a, a concerto. In many ways, it's harder mm -hmm. because you're in the supporting role and yet your contribution really isn't one little bit less, <laughs> you know. I'd like to turn now to another aspect of your program on Monday night. Uh, you began with four Italian songs and then you went into four of Mahler's Wayfarer songs. You sang these exquisitely, with great delicacy, softly, tenderly. I've never heard them sung this way. It was really, really beautiful. And uh, when we talked in May, you mentioned that you were not entirely comfortable with the German language. You're not as familiar with it as you are with the French. But it seemed to come across very, very well, and certainly you sang it with great sensitivity. Well, tell tell you. us how you, you feel about these songs. I actually feel differently about them now, which is so much fun to come back to a piece. I've done them a lot. I'm, I am totally comfortable with the, the Wayfarer songs because I've done them oh, for 20 years and I've done them as a, you know, a kid and now as not a kid. And it, when I first did them, Mahler, when you first hear anything of Mahler, you kind of tears your heart out and you, your first inclination is to weep, literally. And then I used to think these songs, which um, for anyone who, who doesn't know them, are really a man's journey through a disappointed love. In the, in the end, the very last thing of the songs is that everything really is good, alles gut, alles. And that's what I believe. And at the time, I thought, you know, really, he's almost, he's driven to madness. He's lost his mind. He cannot bear the, the, the pain. And, and now I think it's not. It's more of an, an adult acceptance. And that obviously coincides a little bit with just being older. Mm -hmm. that, you know, things happen in lives and they're not deserved or undeserved. They just happen like, like this rain here in <laughs> California. <laughs> yes. I thought this was the sunshine state. Um, and it's, it's all fine. It's all part of a process. And, and so I feel that it's much more of a positive statement, really, the whole thing. It's just a journey. It's going through something. So I feel a little bit more less emotional, but more accepting. So I feel it's, that's what's fun about doing a cycle. And the fact that Mahler 
wrote them for the orchestra and for the piano, so they're a little bit different for the piano. They're I was going to ask you about that. Some singers say that they don't like doing recitals because the voice is so exposed. Mm -hmm. Well, when you did those songs in the piano accompaniment, which doesn't have the sustaining power that of the course. orchestra yeah. does, the voice is completely exposed, yeah. and we get a chance to really hear you almost singing solo in, in, in many passages, yeah. and uh, it was very You wonderful. know, it is. I mean, there are, they are. I feel no less affectionate about these wonderful Mahler songs, and there is something magical that in many of his songs, he did write his own poetry. So they have a an, an added significance, and I think that's what is the most meaningful, and I feel that his thoughts are so tangible and really so current. They're really... Um, they're not quite rap songs, but they're very real, and they're, they're, you can see the exact emotional progression and digression within the songs, and I, I find that fascinating and, and very honest. I think they're a very honest cycle of songs. Well, they are very beautiful, and you certainly sing them exquisitely. You've also done some other German leader. You have recorded Brahms and Schumann duets with Judith Blake, and in fact, we're going to play an excerpt from uh, the... In fact, I think we have two Schumann duets, Terry. Yes, we're going to hear the Botschaft from Opus 74 and Das Gluck from Opus 79. And it's Frederica von Stade along with Judith Blagan, accompanied by Charles Wadsworth. We've just heard two duets by Schumann, the voice of Frederica von Stade, our guest here in the studio this morning, along with Judith Blagan, soprano, accompanied by Charles Wadsworth. This is the CBS recording, A Portrait of Frederica von Stade. Uh, Flicka, going on with German Leader, you certainly are picking songs that you like and that suit your voice, and I'm wondering, have you contemplated uh, singing Schubert and Strauss? I would think a number of their songs would uh, lie beautifully for the lyricism of your voice. I have sung a lot of Schubert songs, and I love Schubert and, and Schumann. Um, I, my greatest clue, really, to singing Schubert and Schumann has been living in Austria, the times I have lived there in the summers at Salzburg or at the Vienna Staatsoper, because so much of Schubert and Schumann are about nature. And you become intensely aware of nature when you're in Austria, especially around Salzburg. I rented a house once. It was a little bit in the mountains, and I used to take um, my kids out for these wonderful walks in the hills because it'd be a little bit of wooded area and then a great expanse of field. And once we heard this rushing sound, and I thought, there's not a highway up here. There can't be a highway up here. It's way We're up in the mountains here. It's, you know, sound of music land. And um, it was a little brook that was running, and you get the whole impact of Bechlein, you know, that, that it sounded like Niagara Falls because of the, 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 the thin air and the, the stillness and the slight bit of wind and, and very much of the... The climate really affects how you feel, the, the pressure, the weather pressure. And so it, in a way, it was the biggest clue I had to what a lot of those songs are about. This, they're very affected by fog and by night and by day and wind and sun. And, and that's been one of the fun parts of, of, of learning some Schubert. And then just this year, I've learned some Strauss so for for a concert, actually, I'm going to do here in San Francisco uh -huh. with the symphony. Oh, wonderful. And I'd, the only Strauss I knew was Rosenkavalier and the Komponist in, in Ariadne and these beautiful Drei Liebeslieder that uh, actually Schwarzkopf found, just three adorable little songs, and that's all I knew of Strauss. And recently I studied, when I did a Carnegie Hall recital, I put on five or six Strauss songs, and... It's a, diff a very different way of singing and, mm -hmm. and very about family and motherhood. Those are the ones that sort of appealed to me. And, um, so I'm, it's a discovery, you know. We heard you last night in a solo recital, and we've also heard you at the San Francisco Opera in, in opera. Which do you prefer, or how do you prepare differently for a solo concert as opposed to a, a role in an opera? They're so different. Um, 
the preparation time, A, we have, you know, weeks of rehearsal. So there's this great camaraderie that usually develops when you're preparing an opera, especially the operas I do, which are all, you know, Mozart or Rossini and um, big casts and, and not so much tension as there might be in a Verdi opera. And so I love them. I just love them personally because of my loving to be home. Um, they are more taxing because unless they're in my backyard, which I've been lucky enough to have recently because of my collaboration at the San Francisco Opera, I don't love it as much because I don't like being away. And so I, that's why I've great, taken a great preference to going out and doing a 10-day tour doing recitals and not knowing I'm not going to be away for six weeks. Um, but uh, they're very different. And a, a, a concert is you have to be more focused in some regards because you're switching languages and you're switching intensity and you're telling stories with very little help. You've just got your face and you've just got um, your words and, and the you have the piano. But we have so much to help us in opera. And I love jumping around. I mean, I love acting, and I love getting dressed up. And So I'd, I, it's hard to say what the preference is. It's good to do opera, too. It's a little bit like, you know, play ball. <laughs> You've got to get in there, and you're, you're, you're in the world of opera, and you're, it's, a, it's different. You're kind of, um, it is, you know, the 49ers. <laughs> But, of course, in recital, you have more control. You can really do what you want and do it the way you want it. You don't have the conductor or a director, you might say, imposing an interpretation on you. Do you find this uh, more satisfying then? Um, no. I, I have had very rare occasions where I've resented the judgment of a mm -hmm. conductor. I've worked with, you know, the greatest conductors. I've been lucky enough with Jimmy Levine, with... Claudio Abbado with Schulte and Karian, I'd be a darn fool to resent <laughs> anything they had to say to me. And I've had very few that I haven't appreciated or enjoyed in other reasons. You know, some of my favorites in the world was Nicky Rossigno and some of the wonderful Italian conductors who were just born with bel canto singing. Um... Some of the producers, some of the directors, I've had some real Lulus, but they've been <laughs> very interesting. They make you kind of defend the music even more strongly. You know, like, I have got to uh, fight harder because the scene isn't helping me. And I haven't done, I haven't had any real horror stories. So I, I like the support. I think one learns an enormous amount from a conductor. Um, and I don't feel any resentment mm -hmm. from what they... i fully convinced they know a heck of a lot more than me. <laughs> uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of your moods in your recital. I would assume that you are picking songs not only that you like and that suit your voice, but also that express aspects of your personality. For example, in Monday night's recital, your songs range from the very sweet and tender sometimes the sad, bittersweet, almost at times elegiac in the case of the Mahler. And then at the end of the first half, you gave us Schoenberg's very funny cabaret <laughs> songs and sort of prepared us for the second half of the program, where in more ways than one, you let your hair down. In the first half of the program, you came out wearing a gorgeous full white gown, <laughs> and your hair was pulled back. In the second half, you came down, your hair had been let down to the shoulders, and you were wearing a slim black gown. And you you really began to, almost at times, ham it up. You became more animated, more vivacious, and funnier. And you gave us songs, like some of the American songs, that were very funny. And a couple of your encores also were very funny. So, in other words, were we seeing two sides of the real flicker here? Well, someone said, um, someone asked me what I was wearing at Carnegie, and I said, well... This is what I've decided. The first half, I'm going to be Tinkerbell, <laughs> and the second half, I'm going to be Morticia. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, so this is Tinkerbell and Morticia. <laughs> um, and you see, when you get to 
be a <laughs> senior member of, of the kind of singing community. You know, why not? It becomes less and less important to make a complete fool of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and I find that I oh. enjoy it more and more. Oh, it was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. And so I feel that um, to a certain extent I did feel an obligation to entertain a little bit. I knew that an enormous part of the public in that night were people that had never been to a recital in their life. That <laughs> was apparent. Well, that was apparent. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I think they were you know, somewhat appalled that they, <laughs> well, we're going to sit and listen to some opera singer for two hours? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, so I felt maybe a, a little bit of an obligation to to be a little bit more entertaining. And I love the, I love those Schoenberg songs. Oh, they're delightful. My, my daughter Jenny <laughs> is so funny. She I forced her to come to a recital I was doing in Cormel when I sang them. And, and I also sang a lot of songs. It is meant to be a man singing which has been, you know, a little bit my life in the opera world. He said, but Mom, why are you singing songs that a boy's meant to sing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that just strikes her as, as so funny. But they're, And people see Schoenberg on the, on the concert and think, oh, my gosh, we'll never understand these, and they're going to be... <laughs> <laughs> and they're some of the best words, some of the, you know, the, some of the lyrics for them are just sensational. So. Well, he spent many years copying out that kind of music uh, for, for a living, yeah. so he knew it intimately. I, I, yes, yeah. and there are plays on words, and oh, I mean, I just adore those songs. One of, mm -hmm. Marty and I are trying to put together a cabaret project using these marvelous William Bolcom songs and Poulenc, I, we know 50 Poulenc songs. I, th I think the funniest one of those was the last one, the aria from the Mirror of Arcady, where you were going boom, 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 flick. Yes. Could you give us a little demonstration of that booming right now for our listeners? Boom, 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 boom. We see, don't expect that opera singer to say, boom, 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 interpreted that exceedingly broadly. <laughs> <laughs> As should be done. Yeah. It was really great fun, and I loved your final encore where you came across as a tipsy chanteuse. <laughs> <laughs> That's a terrific opera, La Pericole of Offenbach. And it's, oh. I first did that. I was the, one of the cousins at the Met. They did this divine production with Cyril Richard, um, you know, 185 years ago. <laughs> it's a divine, oh, all that Offenbach is, I think San Francisco would love it. Mm. Uh, Flicka, in a moment, we'd like to turn back to your opera career, but uh, first we'd like to play a song that you sing periodically. It's called Jenny Rebecca. It's by Carol Hall, and uh, we have a recording by the Utah Symphony. I understand that what your, is your first daughter is named Jenny Rebecca, mm -hmm. so this would make she, this a particular favorite of yours. Absolutely. It's... Um, there's a song written for Barbara Streisand for one at one point, but she's always been too busy, so I've got to wait till she has a little time. You've just heard Jenny Rebecca, sung by Frederica von Stade from this new recording with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir and the Utah Symphony, conducted by Joseph Silverstein. This is Terry Hawkins, along with Marilyn Hagberg. You're listening to the Evening Concert on KPFA. This is KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno. We're going to turn now to some of your opera recordings, and in particular, we'd like to play a selection from Massenet's Werther, which I know is a favorite of yours. We're going to hear in, in a moment the letter scene. Would you like to explain a little bit about what's happening at that point um, in the opera? Well, Werther, the best way to understand it is in the context of um, high soap opera, <laughs> to a certain extent. Um, it is a marvelous piece, and it concerns a, a not mad but rather intense poet named Werther who falls in love with a young girl named Charlotte who, in order to please her mother, has married someone she doesn't love. And, of course, Charlotte and Werther fall madly in love. But she sends him away, and but keeps receiving these incredible letters saying, I'm coming back, I'm coming back at Christmas. And so this is a scene in which she is reading his letters. Um, and he's saying, if I can't come back and if I can't see you, he's 
what is he going to do? He's going to kill himself. And of course he does come back and does kill himself and that's how the how the opera ends. Uh but it's a it's an interesting scene cuz she's just reading all the different types of letters that he's written her and she's hysterical. She doesn't know what to do. She's a devout rather simple girl who's taken over a great responsibility in raising her brothers and sisters because her mother's dead and is astonished by the whole situation and somewhat apprehensive. So. Here now is the letter scene from Werther by Massonet, sung by Frederica von Stade. You've just heard the letter aria from Werther by Massonet, sung by our guest, Frederica von Stade. That's very beautiful music, Flicka. And I think Charlotte is a very interesting character, very developing. I think she's more three, three-dimensional, certainly, than some of the other Massonet characters. Yes, and, and very warmer, really, mm-hmm. according to Massonet, than in the Goethe. Um, Lotte was much more of a cold, sort of cerebral girl than Charlotte. She's just caught in a an incredible, and her life because of this is ruined because mm-hmm. she's in love with him. Her life is over in that, as lives were in those days. Mm-hmm. She's quite a girl, and it it is the most sublime music, um, beautiful music. And yeah. I've been able to do it with some of the greatest tenors, Alfredo Krauss, and and intensely difficult tenor music and beautiful. You've so sung it, it also with Jose Carreras. Yes, and Jose, who I adore. And I get to play a girl. What can I tell you? <laughs> I know I it's a break. It. <laughs> it's a break from your trouser rolls, you get which your dresses and yeah. wigs. And <laughs> <laughs> That's true because you are noted for a number of trouser rolls: Hansel, um, Carabino in uh, Mozart's Marriage of Figaro, Octavian, whom you'll be singing here this summer with the San Francisco Opera. Uh, another aria that we want to play that uh, we both love is uh, from Rossini's Otello. You've done a lot of Rossini, and in our last program we did play the Rossini arias from the Barber of Seville and from uh, La Cenerentola, the Cinderella. This is the Otello, different from the Verdi Otello. Could you talk about that a little bit? Very different. Um, I mean, it's Rossini. It's, it's night and day. But the story is terribly different in many ways that I'm not sure why it isn't often staged, and I've never done mm-hmm. it staged. I've done a full recording. I think the reason is that you really only see Desdemona and Otello after they're mad at each other. <laughs> <laughs> you don't see their... Uh, they talk about their passion and they talk about it, but they don't... You don't actually see it. That There's not one aria where they are in love or that you understand their passion. But this aria is, it's unusual because it can come right out of the opera, too. And one of the most beautiful parts of it is this incredible solo in the harp, just. And we, I remember when we recorded, there was this Welsh girl who played it, and just with all the naturalness and natural musicality, and the whole orchestra just stood up and applauded. It was so beautiful. And... It's it's this very the salci. I mean, it's the little story of sadness with this ominousness and the prayer at the end, and it it has a wonderful simplicity. I've really just loved doing it over the years. Mm-hmm. Let's listen now to Desdemona's aria from Otello, sung by Frederica von Stade. You've been listening to Desdemona's aria from Otello by Rossini performed by our guest this evening, Frederica von Stade. Flicka, a thought that's come to my mind uh, a number of times is about roles that you perhaps haven't sung or haven't sung very often. Your voice is really ideal for the classical opera, for French opera, also for Rossini, and of course you're a great Strauss singer, and I think we'll hear that this summer when you sing Octavian. A friend of mine, Terry also knows her, who is a mezzo-soprano here in the Bay Area, asked me an interesting question recently. She's a fan of yours. She was wondering if you had ever thought of singing Dalila in Saint-Saëns, Samson and Dalila. This is a role that's usually sung by heavier voices, and yet she felt, and I think I tend to agree, that it would be wonderful sung by a lyrical mezzo like you. 
Have you ever given that any I thought? I haven't. I've, I've always had in the back of my mind that it was for a much bigger voice, mm-hmm. you know, a much rounder kind of TT voice, Tatiana Troyanos, Jackie voice. Um, I'm very respectful of the lyricism of my voice. I just can't push it. It just doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And well, the first thing that I look at in many things is the orchestration. And I think the Saint-Saëns orchestration is is not only large, but it's very thick. Uh-huh. I have to be very careful of um, Octavian and of Werther. I have to have conductors who really know what they're getting. That's right, because and the orchestration you know, is very dense very in, in dense, both of those. Very dense. And so you really have to have someone who is enormously sympathetic. You can't compete, you know, w- when the orchestra isn't held down to some extent. So I... It isn't something I've I've thought of, but it mm-hmm. it would mm-hmm. interesting idea. I've been asked to do Carmen, but I mean it's just no, not it's, for me. Yeah, I think that would be th- th- there again. That takes a much heavier, more dramatic voice. Yeah. I think it's wise that you do protect the voice. Yeah, there's just uh, you know it's not to the manner born. But you have done quite a bit of the Baroque also, and of course we heard earlier the Gluck Orfeo, which uh, is beautiful. And you have uh, re- you have performed and recorded the Monteverdi, the Il Ritorno di Lucien Patria, which you sang here, in fact, two years ago. Have you uh, have you ever done Romeo, the Bellini Romeo? No, I just um, with Seiji Azawa, um, Kathy Battle, and I did excerpts from from um, Capuletti. And we had a ball doing it. Mm-hmm. I just mm-hmm. loved it. I had always thought that was a little bit dramatic. It's very difficult role, the mm-hmm. Romeo and that. Um, but w- I just loved it. I do absolutely treasure Bellini. I think the great master of song, everything about bel canto can be understood in one Bellini aria or mm-hmm. song. And so I just, this little bit that we did, we did a, a long love duet. And I guess it's in the second act. Um, and I love doing it. And Seiji was terrific. Mm-hmm. So I would think I'd, I'd, I'd love to try that on, fit that on. I'd love to do Adalgisa again. Well, De- you know, in a few years. Um, you tried that uh, very early in your career, didn't you? And it, it came out somewhat less than successfully, I understand. Well, I did it with a soprano who had just a Wagnerian voice. Mm. And it was a, uh, that was a total mismatch. And I was way too young to do it. But I did love it. I just love those tunes. And I think it's always been in the tradition of a much bigger voice. But there is something that I don't think should be a bigger voice, because Adalgisa is meant to be the younger sort of paramour, and that the youthfulness would come across not the... the, I think it should be two sopranos almost. Mm -hmm. Before we leave the Baroque, um, you uh, and the classical, you're going to be essaying a complete Handel opera this summer yes. at Santa Fe, I've Xerxes. Never... You mentioned it back in May that you wanted to do more Handel, yeah, and that uh, so it was very good, good for the voice, yeah, that it keep, helps just... keep it flexible. Yes, and I've never done it before, and so I'm looking forward to it a lot. Mm-hmm. I'd like to turn back to another of your favorite composers, Mozart. You, of course, are noted for your Carabino, which a role which you told us last time you've now relinquished. But uh, you have done other Mozart roles, uh, notably Sesto in La Clemenza di Tito, and we'll be singing that next season at the San Francisco Opera, so I'm certainly looking forward to that. You also have sung Zerlina in Don Giovanni, uh, which is a delightful role for mezzo, and we're going to play an excerpt from that. Uh, have you performed that a great deal? I know you haven't performed Zerlina as much as you have Carabino or Sesto. No, I did. I did it a lot at the Met for a number of years, like 10 years, and then I just haven't done it so much, but I love Zerlina. And, Sam, and I think I did it Santa Fe as well. Mm-hmm. That's another so. great dress part for Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. We've just heard two arias from Mozart. First from Don Giovanni, we heard Vedrai Carino. And from La Clemenza di Tito, we heard Parto Parto, both sung by our guest this evening, Frederica von Stada. We've been listening to Frederica von Stada in the aria Must the Winter Come So Soon from the opera Vanessa by the American composer Samuel Barber. One thing I'd like to ask you about your voice. When I first heard the first recording of yours that I heard, anyway, with the Columbia recording that you made with some leader and uh, many different composers, 
I thought, what a wonderful, sweet voice this is. I enjoyed it tremendously. More recently, I seem to have heard, well, well, the sweetness certainly remains. I have heard an intensity in your voice that I would hear before on certain notes, but now I seem to hear it almost all the time, and it's really a thrilling effect. Does that make sense to you, or am I, am I completely out to lunch? How, no. how do you yourself think your voice has changed? I, I do think voices change just in that they, um, you know, age, <laughs> period. And um, I think they, they darken a little bit. Mine has not darkened the way mm. it could have or the way some voices. Mine has... You know, in the in the category um, of like Teresa and Berganza, it started out being a lyric voice. In the middle, it was a lyric voice, and at the end, it'll be a lyric voice. And but within that, I have um, it changes somewhat. I think it is in in nature a bit darker, and um, I feel more dramatic. You know, <laughs> I feel more dramatic because of hundreds of things. You know, experience in the business, the repertoire that I'm doing, what's happened to me in my life. Um, certainly, you know, having children and going through the the ecstasy, uh, really, of being crazy about your children and and worrying about them. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, you change. And I think uh, it's it's reflected in my voice. I think it's um, it's just there, and I I don't I've, I've actually it's a, a nice thought to think about. I haven't thought about it, so I'm talking off the top of my head. But I think it has changed. Um, I think it's appropriate for me to give up some of the roles I have been doing. I think they're just some wonderful newcomers who should be doing them and it's appropriate it's time and I like that I don't regret it one little bit I feel that to ask any more of some some roles it would be just greed <laughs> and I look forward to the other ones I mean I really am looking forward to um, dangerous liaison you know playing a real mean <laughs> you know erica on <laughs> one life to live <laughs> can't wait um i do i look forward to that and i i don't mind showing that either i don't mm -hmm. mind i feel much more willing and able to show more of what i'm thinking and what i'm feeling about life and people and basically i love life and love people um but it's okay to show extreme points of view in the in the in the process and I like that I think that's what I'm meant to do now I think that's what artists singers performers at my stage of a career are supposed to do I feel like um, I've done what I've done you know like I am in the most modest sense of the word a master I know what I'm doing um, that doesn't mastery does have nothing to do with perfection. I have to make that <laughs> extremely clear. The voice and especially my voice is an exceedingly imperfect instrument. But I know I know what I need to do and I know how to do it and I'm I don't think I'd ever be a singing teacher, but I'd love to share what I know with younger singers. I couldn't teach singing. It's too great a responsibility, but I could share what I know and the processes and that, you know, sort of like a support for young singers. You're fine, don't worry, keep going, go for it. You know, this is fine, believe. Uh, the voice is such a fragile instrument and it, it takes so much really to put it out there that uh, you need kind of every support system you can. Well, you've certainly cared for your voice well. You're going into your third decade now <laughs> as an opera singer, as a recitalist, and the voice is still ravishingly lyrical and really beautiful, and I think Thank we'll be you. looking forward to what you have coming up, the La Clemenza di Tito in the fall, the uh, De Rosen Cavalier at San Francisco in the summer, and for those of us that are going to make it to Santa Fe, your handle. And Terry, back to you. 
Well, I'd just like to say thank you very much for coming down here this morning, after, especially after the recital that you sang last night. It's always a pleasure to have you on the program. Open invitation. Please thanks, come back Terry. anytime whatsoever. Thank you very much. Look, thanks. thanks again. It's been a great pleasure.